pleasure. Daniel, thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, it's an honor, a privilege to be here today. I want to first uh, thank the Cadet Wing, the Academy, the faculty and staff, especially General Silveria, and my congratulations early to the class of 2018. And so I just want to mention, obviously, I'm here because I have a great partner at the University of Southern California in Lieutenant Colonel Olivia Nelson. And, <laughs> and I'm really particularly pleased that the class of 2018, your exemplar is Louis Zamperini, who happens to be a USC Trojan. And to the class of 2019, your class exemplar happens to be Neil Armstrong, who's also a USC Trojan. So I'm in the right place. We're going to talk about homegrown violent extremism today. We're going to talk about some threats, and we're going to talk about things that may be closer to us than we think. And I want to commend General Silveria in the way that he handled an incident earlier this year. And although it turned out to be quite different in terms of who was responsible, his response to this incident was extraordinary and certainly demonstrates the class and caliber of instruction and leadership that you have here. So I'm going to make this really simple. Race is the 800-pound gorilla in the room. When we talk about homegrown violent extremism, when we talk about terrorism, when we talk about hate crimes, it really is that 800-pound gorilla that we've got to become a little bit more acquainted with and a little bit more candid in terms of talking about. You, interestingly enough, meaning this demographic, represent an incredible target-rich environment for recruiters out there. And I will, as I go through this talk today, talk about people who I now work with, who I call formers, who are adept at recruiting anybody from who has as much as an eighth grade education to a PhD to some of their extremist ideologies. And you can see there, compared to the period last year, we've seen a significant increase in the number of incidents that have occurred across college campuses in this country. What you may not know, is I have had a distinguished background that I'm very, very humbled to have been in that position. I've served in public safety or counterterrorism at every level of government, but probably the most fun was in the FBI, where I spent uh, the majority of my time on SWAT and also the, a period of time working undercover. And so as I was working undercover, I was in a period of the time in those operations where I wasn't allowed to go to the office anymore. I was deep. And I had a contact agent who I would debrief with. But while I was on SWAT, I was at least able to go out with my team, join them at, on the range, and I could stay pretty close with them. They were my closest family in the Bureau. So I'm coming back from SWAT training one afternoon, and I'm stopping at a light, and two guys pull up next to me. And I've got my window up waiting for the light to change to green, and I can tell that they're having a lot of fun with me. They're flipping me off, they're saying things, and I'm saying to myself, this has got to be the longest light in San Diego. I'm also saying to myself, as I'm wearing a net at that time, a SIG on my hip, I had a fully automatic MP5 submachine gun in a case next to me on the seat, and a trunk that looked like a local gun store, I'm saying, these guys are lucky it's me. <laughs> but then as that light turned green, the passenger rolled the window down, leaned out of the window, and said, Heil Hitler. And it reminded me how close that threat can be. I was in San Diego in a county where crosses were still being burned, where my squad was working cases on that issue, and I realized again how close the threat can be. On 9-11, and like many of you who may be in, of my generation, uh, I have to remind myself, and I have graduate students, and when I talk about 9-11, I realize that some of them were in grammar school. But I have to remind them that we had things happen that day that caught our attention. We saw pronouncements like this online. May the war be started. Death to his enemies. May the World Trade Center burn to the ground. We would have thought that was coming from Al-Qaeda. We would have thought the source was some Islamic extremist organization. But instead, it came from Pennsylvania, from August Kreese, who was a grand wizard or dragon in the Klan chapter that was in Pennsylvania, reaching out to Ayman al-Zawahiri, who at the time was number two in Al-Qaeda to say, partner with us. The cells are in place. We have the same enemy. And thankfully for us, Al-Qaeda and Zawahiri blew him off. If we look at data from 9-11, you can see an interesting trend that's happened, as put together by my colleague Peter Bergen, who's one of the few Western journalists who interviewed bin Laden. He's at the New America Foundation. And you can see there in the graph 
before you that we've had some interesting upticks since 9-11 with the jihadist bar graph being shown in gray and the non-jihadist being shown in red. And you see two particular significant increases in 2008 and 2012, which should come as no surprise because 2008 and 2012 were the years of the election and re-election of Barack Obama. And they were incredible recruiting opportunities for a number of organizations. And let's talk about some things that happened. James Von Brun, who walked into one of two museums in this country that have walked through metal detectors all the time, that being the Holocaust Museum in Washington and the Museum of Tolerance in West Los Angeles. He killed a security officer because he was anti-Semitic and a neo-Nazi Holocaust denier. Michael Wade Page, who walked into Sikh Temple in Wisconsin and did the same thing. Richard Deere, who was an anti-abortion adherent and went in that afternoon and killed an Iraqi war veteran, an off-duty police officer, and a mother of two children. Kevin Harfum, who we arrested in an FBI sting operation, who had planned to put remote-controlled improvised explosive devices along the parade route for Martin Luther King Parade. Dylan Roof, who of course requires and deserves no explanation, because you all know who he is. And Emmanuel Sampson, who decided to avenge the attack of Dylan Roof by going to a church of white parishioners in Texas and killing people there. So we can see we've had some interesting things that have happened over a period of time. And 2015 was the deadliest year we have for domestic terrorism in this country since the, world, since the attack on the Murrah Building in 1995 by Timothy McVeigh. And what's interesting there, if we're going to talk about policy, is that if you look at the graph, you look at the chart, you can see that 75% of the 52 attacks were carried out by two extremist ideologies. That being white supremacy and the other being domestic Islamic extremists. So if we're really going to direct policy and have it be evidence-based, it would suggest that our policy should target those two groups. And then along comes Omar Mateen a year later, who goes into Pulse nightclub and almost exceeds the entire body count of the previous year when he kills 49 people and swears allegiance to the so-called Islamic State. That, of course, skews our graph. And you can see there now we've got 71% of our attackers being attached to domestic Islamic extremism and an interesting uptick in a phenomenon of black nationalism, which I'll talk about here in a moment. So we have something called hate crimes. And I'm always saying, why do we deal with hate crimes? Why don't we call things domestic terrorism? And that's an interesting discussion. But if we want to talk about hate crimes for what they are, you can see here Jeremy Christian, who you all remembered in Portland, Oregon, killed Ricky Best and the other gentleman who came to the rescue of two girls on a train as he was taunting them because one of them was wearing a hijab. And he, these gentlemen jumped in and said, why don't you knock it off? And he wound up stabbing them to death and stabbing a third person who was able to survive the attack. And you're looking at Jeremy there in the lower photograph where a week or two before he had a confrontation with law enforcement where he was out there and had a baseball bat and they talked him down and were able to take him into custody. Sean Urbanski, who attacked Richard Collins III, who was an ROTC cadet at Bowie State in Maryland, waiting on the corner with his friends for his Uber ride, when Urbanski, who had a long, lengthy social media history of being racist, anti-Semitic, homophobic, Islamophobic, and went up to Richard Collins and stabbed him in the chest. Richard Collins was three days away from being commissioned an officer when he was going to graduate from Bowie State. So I offer you that information because, again, I happen to be a professor now, and I'm very fortunate to be at USC. But I say to people who want to have these discussions with me about what the threat looks like, as W. Edwards Deming said, one of our famous, most famous data scientists, without data, you're just another person with an opinion. So let's talk about this. In 2009, the DHS Intelligence and Analysis Unit put out a report, and they talked about some of these threats. Most importantly, the threat that we face from the right wing and the threat we face from returning veterans from Iraq and Afghanistan who might be prime targets for recruitment. The report was vilified. Secretary Napolitano pulled it, disbanded the unit, and everything we thought went away. We did a survey. Our sister center at the University of Maryland did a survey of local law enforcement to ask, what do you think are your top three domestic terrorism threats? And they came back this way. The first were sovereign citizens a group of, in, of people around the country who are loosely organized 
and believe the United States government is not legitimate. They engage in something called paper terrorism. They don't pay taxes. And here we have two officers from West Memphis, Arkansas on patrol, and they stop a father and son team of sovereigns named Jerry and Joseph Kane. Jerry and Joseph Kane were out putting on seminars for $100 a head. They get stopped, and these individuals often carry their own driver's licenses, their own license plates. They don't comply, or do they believe they have to comply with law enforcement? Mr. Kane gets out of the car and shows Officer Evans his fake driver's license, and as he's doing that, he pushes him, and his son bails out with an AK-47 and kills both officers. Unfortunate moral to this story, and I'll make it short, is that when the chief arrived on this scene to see who his two fallen officers were, he didn't know till he got there that his son, Brandon, had been killed in the attack. Number two in that survey were Muslim extremists. You can see Officer Jesse Hartnett there. He's a Philadelphia officer, and he's on patrol in his unit in downtown Philadelphia when Edward Archer's walking at the car, shooting at the window. The officer takes 10 rounds in his left arm up against the window and is able to return fire on Archer, who's then hit in the lower back and taken into custody and swears allegiance to ISIS as he's taken into custody. And then last in that survey were anti-government and armed militia individuals. Officer Saldo and Becker in Las Vegas, they're eating pizza. The, Amanda and Jared Miller had been at the Clive and Bundy Ranch providing security when the Bundys found out that Jared was a convicted felon. And they said, we've got to get him out of here. He's not supposed to be in the possession of a firearm. And they kick him off the ranch. They go back to Las Vegas and they're not happy. Jared's really upset. We dedicated ourselves. We drove up there in our own time. We were going to provide security. How dare they do that? We've got to do something. And they go down to the pizza place where these officers are having lunch and they're sitting there and they execute the two of them. They disarm the officers and drop a flag with a swastika on one officer's body and the Gadsden don't tread on me flag on the other officer's body before then they go across the street to a Walmart. Jared fires around into the ceiling, all the people stream out of there. A citizen who has a concealed weapons permit decides he's gonna take on Jared and doesn't know that Amanda 10 feet behind him is with him and he gets shot and killed. At the end of that story, Jared's killed by SWAT, and Amanda takes her own life. And then last but not least, the group that took the Malheur compound in Oregon almost two years ago now, and were then taken into custody by the FBI and our hostage rescue team because they had no hostages, and we waited them out, and one individual said he wouldn't be taken alive, and in a traffic stop went into his waistband and was killed by HRT. And again, these are incidents that don't sometimes get a lot of traffic in terms of local media, or national media, but things that do happen. And then we go back to that DHS INA report in 2009. And we have a rally going on in Dallas, Texas, and the Dallas Police Department, who has one of the most incredible relationships with, lo with the local community there, is marching along with Black Lives Matter protesters because they all know each other. When Micah Johnson takes up a position of, a, a, a thar I should say, a position of advantage, and kills five officers that day because he's on a rampage because he's upset that police officers are killing African Americans. When he's finally killed later on by a robot that Chief Brown deployed with an IED. Eight days later, Gavin Long does the same thing in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. What do these two guys have in common? Micah Johnson's a United States Army veteran and Gavin Long is a former United States Marine. So the things that we saw in the report in 2009 start to become true. And we've seen an instance where we've had a few bad men in the military. Matt Bushbacher there, who's an active duty Navy SEAL, standing on his website in front of a flaming swastika. James Douglas Ross doing the same thing, who's a military intelligence officer. And what would we be in Iraq if we didn't have a gang member throwing gang signs? And then last but not least, T.J. Lydon, who was one of the most incredible recruiters we had in California, in Riverside, and San Bernardino County, who used to brag about how he had the ability to recruit almost anybody. An interesting turnaround, and TJ walked into the Simon Wiesenthal Center in Los Angeles and turned himself in, essentially, to Rabbi Hooper and Rabbi, Rabbi Heyer, who I know very well, and said, I want to help you. I know how this happens. And now he's working with the Simon Wiesenthal Center. As a matter of fact, TJ Lydon was touring the country giving talks along with Matt Shepard's mom. You may remember Matthew Shepard was a young man 
who was gay and tied to a fence and left to die. T.J. Lydon and Matt Shepard's mom were traveling the country giving talks on how this hatred can turn into violence and can turn into death and what we need to do about it. There we see a dispatch from during the war in Iraq. We said, we've got Aryan nations graffiti in Baghdad. That's a problem. Most recently, this past Christmas, we had a thwarted attack by another veteran who was going to use a whole accumulation of successful tactics, including driving a vehicle into crowds, getting them to funnel into areas where they're going to be easy targets. He's going to take them on with explosives and weapons. And here, here we see Everett Jameson, who again had converted to Islam, had absorbed that radicalization or that extremist rhetoric, and decided he was going to attack, and he was also a former Marine. What's interesting about all of this is that our, despite our fear about immigrants, despite our fear about refugees, we're talking about people who've had no foreign training. I was humbled to be invited to speak at the first and only hearing in the Boston Marathon's bombing. When I testified that day, one of the things I talked about was why this happens and why it will happen again. The Sonayev brothers, Jahar on the left, Tamerlan on the right, and Tamerlan has a very long story of how his path to radicalization got him to where he is. But what's really interesting about Tamerlan, and a story that's not often told, is the fact, in, in addition to being a domestic Islamic extremist, he was also a neo-Nazi Holocaust denier. Nadal Hassan at Fort Hood, who, by the way, wasn't charged with domestic terrorism because we don't have a statute for domestic terrorism here, and he was charged with workplace violence. Timothy McVeigh, by the way, was charged with using a weapon of mass destruction. Dylan Roof in South Carolina was charged with a hate crime. And the couple in San Bernardino, who, by the way, of all the people that were killed that day, the first person killed was a colleague of mine named Hal Bowman, who I worked with at USC at our DHS Center of Excellence, who was the first person shot there five times, and he had just left our center years before to work in San Bernardino, and he leaves two daughters because he was a single parent. What's really scary now is the fact that we have incidents like this where now our homegrown groups have taken taxes that have worked for other organizations and other ideologies and used them. James Field, who ran over Heather Heyer in Charlottesville, is no different than anybody else using a vehicle in London, in Nice, in Paris, in Berlin to kill people. And so now what we're seeing is, is what we're seeing is a situation of violence and radicalization where it's starting to mirror each other in terms of tactics being used. They do their homework, these organizations. Some of you may be familiar with Inspire Magazine, which is a magazine that's put out by the Arabian, uh, Al Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula. I'm sure you wouldn't be surprised to find that their first editor in chief was an American, Samir Khan. I'm really, really fortunate and humbled to have five former students in the FBI a number of students in the State Department, and a whole host of other three-letter acronym organizations. So I'm at home on Friday night, and I get a call from a former student. He says, hey, Professor, Al-Qaeda magazine Inspire's coming out tomorrow. I said, oh, good, because I read all of it. He goes, no, you don't understand. You're in it. My Israeli friends, who have an incredible, interesting sense of humor, said, hey, you've arrived. Uh, my wife didn't think it was so funny. In any event, they have a section there called Hear the World, quotes from friends and foe. And I was in there in some pretty interesting and, and pretty impressive company. Former FBI Director Mueller, Nadal Hassan, former President Obama, Cornel West, Adam Gadan, another American from California. And they had a quote in there that I had put out in an interview I did with a blog out of DC called Security Debrief that most of my colleagues don't even know exists, where they had quoted me on marathons being soft targets, being targets of the future, and how difficult and vulnerable they, they might be as we went forward. They had the quote accurate, they had the photo accurate, and they knew exactly what they were talking about. They do their homework, and we need to certainly give them more credit than we do. So if I don't have enough problems and I've got people like Al-Qaeda who've decided that I'm on their radar screen. As I'm talking today about race and how critical it is and how challenging it is, I wrote an article for USA Today called Extremism on Race is the Real Enemy. And I have to happen to have a colleague there at USA Today, and I said, do me a favor. I know everything goes online. My mom is 84 years old. Can you at least put it in the newspaper print one time so I can get her copies? And they said, we'll see what we can do. 
And it goes into the Monday morning edition of USA Today, all across America. That's the front door of my house on Monday morning. That's the front door of my house after the drive-by on Tuesday afternoon. Because in that article, I talked about some things that had happened in Dallas and Baton Rouge, where at that time, the presumptive nominee, who was Mr. Trump, decided to blame those shootings on President Obama, and I thought that was over the line. Someone took the time in 24 hours to find out where I live and shoot at the front door of my house. Yes, it does say I'm a former FBI agent and a former assistant chief of police. In that article byline, it didn't matter. That's the front door of my house today. So, in the famous words of Winston Churchill, you have enemies? Good. That means you stood up for something sometime in your life. And I'm happy to be there. I grew up, grew up in the 60s, a really different and difficult time. This was very common. Images like this, Rosa Parks, the Olympics in 1968. The police were not necessarily my friend, although I never had a whole lot of negative contacts. The contacts I did have were at least demoralizing, if not embarrassing and frustrating, because when you're being stopped for nothing more than the color, as you walk, your color as you're walking down the street. It probably sounds really strange, knowing my background now, to know what my relationship or my feelings about the police were then. My dad used to always say to me, he says, you know what? If you don't like things, you can't change the castle from outside the moat. And so that led to me to be in a position where I am now, where, yeah, I can be part of that change. And it's nice to know that you've got a person like General Sil Silveria who understands you are part of that change. You can be part of that movement that makes these things right. I've been very fortunate, and I'm just a kid from Elizabeth, New Jersey. I had met a cadet here yesterday and said, you're from Elizabeth? Nobody comes out of Elizabeth. Because um, she happened to be from Elizabeth as well. But you know, I'm still in a country where anything can happen, and you can be anything you want. I never knew that I'd be 37 years friends with Arnold Schwarzenegger. I never knew that I'd be appointed by the governor to serve in the governor's office of Homeland Security, but it happened. I didn't know that I'd be President Obama's first nominee to head the TSA, but it happened. Nobody's special. I work hard, I dream a little bit, and I do get lucky sometimes, but it wouldn't have happened in any other country. I wouldn't be here if it weren't for public service. And for those of you here, I want to say thank you for your service. And I'm encouraged when I see young men and women like I've seen the last couple of days who are fit and intelligent and really want to make a change in America and are in the service of protecting our country. And I got to tell you, I thought we had athletic facilities at USC. We've got nothing compared to you. <laughs> My center at USC is the Safe Communities Institute, and we're focused on violence prevention. So this discussion today really is about violence prevention. And although we have people who engage in ideologies from as far left as Antifa and as far right as neo-Nazis, and somewhere in between with, with ISIS and other ideologies. It's all about stopping the violence. I'm working on a number of projects, and I've been fortunate enough to have worked in the Somali-American community in Minneapolis. It is the largest Somalian community outside of the country of Somalia. They've been a prime target, a target-rich environment, actually, for al-Shabaab during 2008, 2009, and most recently for ISIS in these last later years for recruiting people from that community to become foreign fighters. I'm sure you wouldn't be surprised to hear that the number one challenge for those individuals has been identity. Some of the programs that have been working there are soccer. I was there for two days and found out if I wanted to talk to a recruiter, where to go. 48 hours I found out where I could go. These kids know where they could go. And fortunately, they've chosen to do other things like soccer, like after-school programs. We have an individual there I work with named Muhammad Ahmed. He runs a cartoon series called Average Muhammad. His attitude is, in order to be able to challenge this average ideology, you have to be an average person. So he comes up with this cartoon series. And this guy's working at 7-Eleven, putting this cartoon series together out of his bedroom. He runs into us, and I see him on CNN, and he starts getting emails from around the world, checks from around the world. He says, what do I do with this? 
I said, well, you know, Mohammed, you really need to become a nonprofit. So my partner and I help him put together his nonprofit. As we serve on his board, and now he's funded by Google Ideas. And he's almost doing this full time. Is it working? We're getting cyber attacked by ISIS daily to the hundreds, if not thousands sometimes, of hits per day. We've got their attention. It's working. Last but not least, we have a whole collection of families out there who've lost their sons and daughters. Officer Alice White is in Minneapolis and put together a number of programs to support these families. And she puts on a youth safety camp every year. It's becoming quite successful. I'm now going back to Minneapolis, not to find out why people are going to Syria, but to find out why they're not. Because what I'm telling you, with those couple of dozen of people that have done this over the last four to five years, there are hundreds, if not thousands, of young men and women who live there who this extremist, radicalized method, me, uh, message that's going out is not resonating with them. We want to know why. We want to know why it's not working. They go to the same schools. They're all friends. Why does this person choose to go? This person, other person chooses not to. Thanks to some of the connections that I have through former students, I'm able to work in the State Department. I'm teaching in France, I'm teaching in London, I'm teaching in Lyon, and I'm teaching in Israel. And when I'm in France, they've taken a whole different approach to this. They have an incredibly large population, significant population of radicalized individuals. They're looking at this as a mental health issue. So when I sit in meetings in Paris and Lyon, I'm sitting with counterterrorism experts, intelligence community, defense community, psychologists, psychiatrists, MDs, coroners, and people in the medical community, because that's how we're going to take a look at this now. We've got to try everything, and we're going to try everything. We have a relationship now with these universities, a formalized relationship, and it's often that I go there and sit in meetings to talk about some of the challenges that they have as people from their own country now. And if you don't know, the Charlie Hebdo attack was perpetuated by Frenchmen. Those guys were born in Paris. They weren't immigrants. They weren't refugees. They were born there. So those countries, France, the UK, Germany, and the United States, we all have a common problem that we have to address. The sad thing is we do have parents that, do, that see something and say something. Sal Sheffey is in Northern California. He did something that as a, as a father, I don't know if I could have done. I would hope I could have done this and believe I would have done this, but none of us will know until it happens. He thought his son was radicalized. He saw something and said something. He called the FBI. The FBI got into Adam's phone, and Adam was much farther along that radicalization pathway than Dad thought. He talked about spilling blood. He talked about going overseas. He talked about killing Americans. At the end of the day, when Adam went to the airport to allegedly get on a plane for his humanitarian mission to Turkey, he got arrested by the FBI, and now he's facing prosecution. His dad said, you know, you don't really give me much of an opportunity here or a choice. I've got two choices as a father. I either call you or I, don't, I say nothing and hope nothing happens. As a country and in terms of policy, we've got to come up with other options to that. We cannot arrest or kill our way out of this situation, and it is not going to go away. I work with a number of formers around the world, and I do believe that they're part of the answer. These are people who, just like Adam, were normal, average, everyday young men and women who decided that this was something that appealed to them. Ishmael Royer used to be with a group called the Virginia Jihad Network, or the Virginia Paintball Group. I lectured about him 15, almost 20 years ago. Ishmael emails me last year when he comes out of prison. He was at Supermax here. He routinely knew or communicated with Richard Reed, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, Kevin James from Los Angeles. They're all there. And Ishmael said, I've been reading what you're writing. I want to help. I brought him to USC to give a talk. He's working construction. He's a convicted terrorist. He's not going to get a job doing anything. He comes to USC and gives a talk, and we maximize his exposure in terms of the media. He goes back to, Los to DC. He gets a phone call from a think tank there. He's now working two blocks from the White House on counter messaging for online recruitment efforts to people trying to get them to join terrorist organizations. He fought in Bosnia. 
he was on his way to fight in, for lashkar e taiba when he got arrested and sentenced to 20 years and served 14 of those years in prison. Murad Benishali, who's from France, who was picked up on the battlefield in Pakistan, wrong place, wrong time, and was finally exonerated after spending years at Gitmo, who's also working now to counter this challenge in France. David Vallette, who was a bomb maker from Lyon. David served a number of years in prison. And when I met him and I talked to him, and he said, you know, I got a second chance. I got my high school diploma in prison. I have a job now. I feel like I should give back to my country. When I talked to the prosecutors in France and said, this guy can help you. And they said, no, Errol, we don't want to make a rock star out of him. Who far be it from me an American to suggest to the French what they should do in their own country. And I backed off. Six months later, I get emails from David showing me flyers where he's speaking around the country on countering homegrown violent extremism because he decided it was a good idea. And now that's what he's doing. Mubin Sheikh in Canada, who used to be with Al-Qaeda and wound up working with the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, who's now, again, a former and working against this radicalization effort. Tony McAleer, who was head of the White Aryan Resistance out of Illinois, who works along with Angela King, and all three of them and myself are part of and on the board of a group called Life After Hate, which is an international group of former neo-Nazis and right-wing extremists working against this ideology. We had a homegrown violent extremism summit in November that was quite successful, and we're pushing forward now with research, education, and awareness, and intervention for people who might be moving toward these ideologies. You know, we all talk about, geez, we should do some things that other countries do, like profile. Does this look, look, look like a couple that's headed to join ISIS and have their honeymoon in Damascus? Jalen and Muhammad were high school students in Mississippi, and that exactly was the plan to go join ISIS, celebrate our wedding, and have our honeymoon in Damascus. And now they're both in prison for 10 years. Life's ruined. Lives ruined and futures essentially almost over. So I'm going to share this with you. We thought we knew who our enemy was when World War II started, when we interned 120,000 Japanese Americans. One third of them were children. Many of those families were separated from each other. At the, during the course of that war, we arrested four people for espionage. None of them were of Japanese or Asian descent. I hope we never make that mistake again. So I'm going to lighten the mood here for a moment. First of all, I want to give a big shout out to the Pyeongchang 2018 women's hockey team. But I'm going to date myself here. I was a police officer in Santa Monica during the 1984 Olympics. Talk about being lucky. I'm working and getting paid to watch track practice with people like Carl Lewis and that 4x100 relay team. I'm going to gymnastic events. And we're just having an incredible time. By the way, I used to, I used to call it the 1984 Swatarama and Weapons Expo because we had so many people there from agencies that nothing happened the whole 15 days in L.A. But here's something I'm going to share with you that you probably don't know. McDonald's decided we're going to take advantage of this. We're going to give away a free Big Mac every time we get a gold medal. We're going to give away fries every time we get a silver medal. And we're going to give away a Coke every time we win a bronze. We won so many medals that McDonald's almost shut down. But I say this because one thing I do always notice for 15 days during the Winter Olympics and for 15 days during the Summer Olympics, we all agree we're Americans. We all agree we're from the same country. We drop all that other partisan nonsense and we become one. If I could only just harness that for the remaining days of the year and make it last, we'd be on to something. And that's something we need to think about doing. So I'm going to say here again, because I happen to be a Winston Churchill fan when it comes to things he's said and done. I want you to think about some of the things I shared today. I want you to think about these challenges and what they mean to you because we are the security we're looking for. We are the solution we're looking for. 
and as it relates to some of the violence and things that are happening today, we can do something. And this is not the end. It's not the beginning of the end, but it certainly is the end of the beginning. Thank you very much. Good time. Dr. Southers, thank you for your message. At this time, I would like to open the floor for questions. I won't ask, announce the last question as we approach two minutes remaining in the session. In addition, Dr. Southers will be available for questions after the session. Okay, thank you. Questions? Yes, sir. Hey, good afternoon, sir. This is C1C Ziegler. Um, my question, so before this brief, I had very limited knowledge. I still have very limited knowledge on the subject. Um, but I noticed that one thing that was common, not through all the cases that you talked about, but very common was a social media presence. And uh, especially with this most recent act of violence in Florida, it seems to also have been a social media presence there as well. So my question to you, sir, is, is there uh, countermeasures in place that our government agencies can act on when they see those social media upstairs, you know, someone who has uh, a, a history of posting comments and pictures that, that would you know, get, get someone in the FBI or another agency going, this could be a, a domestic terrorist here. Mm -hmm. can, can we act on those things or are those things that we just have to monitor? That's a great question. So let me give you a two-part answer. The first part as a prelude and the second part directly to your question. Um, one of the things I found out in Minneapolis, and I use that as an example, is that despite the social media recruitment strategy, that the majority of the effort was on the ground, peer-to-peer, -peer, face to face. So that was a reality we had to come to grips with, with the fact that these, those recruiters are here. When you talk about issues like Parkland and other places, great question. I'll ask the audience, what are you willing to give up as it relates to civil liberties and privacy? Do we have the capacity? Of course, we can. I'm at the Air Force Academy. You know what we can do. We have the capacity. It's a matter of what you want to give up. Now, the French, during their emergency order, they gave that up. In fact, last year, they just prosecuted and sentenced their first individual for, for visiting jihadi websites to four years in prison. I don't know what he did. I don't know the extent to what visiting meant to them, but he's got four years in prison. So I guess what it really comes down to is what we're willing to sacrifice in the way of civil liberties and privacy if we're going to monitor that kind of activity, which is in some cases going to be overwhelming. I mean, I'm guilty of that. My students are hitting on those sites all the time because they're doing research. Um, when do you tip over to the point where it becomes something where they have to take action and actually do something? So that's, that's an interesting question. It's just, and, I, and I'll throw this out to you. After 9-11, when they polled the American public, most people said, do whatever you have to do to make us safe. After Boston, that poll changed. The American public's attitude changed. And if there's no greater demonstration of the change, look at the challenge we had with that iPhone after the attack in San Bernardino. So people are not as open and willing to do that in terms of have us take action. We have the technology, we have the capacity. It's a matter of what we're willing to withstand in the way of the reduction of civil liberties and privacy. It's a very good question. And I know one day we're gonna have to cross that bridge. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, thank you, sir. Will O'Connor from the Corbell School at University of Denver. Okay. It seems a lot in your talks, uh, especially given with the communities in Minnesota, is that you and also David Coe Collins speak on this, you're given an alternative opportunity. And while me and my studies, I've done a lot with Middle East groups in Southeast Asia, India, it seems to me I understand how to give an opportunity to them in a foreign context. But when it comes to DTs, especially the white supremacists, the alt-rights, I'm kind of at a loss as where the opportunity is because generally they come from a certain, you know, social and, you know, racial class that is usually very privileged in America. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if you can speak on the best ways to kind of limit the danger they pose and also give them an opportunity without disenfranchising other marginalized communities. I think it's a very good question. Um, and I would have to defer to my colleagues who are in Life After Hate who have been skinheads and been in the movement. Um, they believe that the intervention that they offer is, is sort of that opportunity uh, in counseling and um, other resources that they can use. Uh, it's not, how should I say this? There seems to be a reluctance on a part of that community and what I've seen in white supremacists to come out. 
Um, I thought we have a new organization in Southern California right near um, the Air Force Base uh, called RAM. They're the Rise Above Movement. I had one of their individuals who was going to defect. He wanted to talk to me. We got up to the day before and he de declined. That's very common. What we don't see in the white supremacy movement and in the extreme right movement is that willingness to come out and engage. They will come out and engage with people who are like them. So I think the best opportunity you have, unlike Minnesota where I can work with the community and not be Somali and offer things, it seems that the only time they're willing to do that is when they're working with people that have been down that path. So I would suggest if that's going to be a, ch a target or an objective, you've got to engage them. I mean, look, I used to work gangs when I was a police officer. It's one thing for me to say something to a gangster. It's another thing for a former gang member to say it. So I think if I kind of shift that over to the white supremacy movement, I think you've got to have formers who are part of your effort or else they're not going to become engaged. It's a really good question. It's one of those research issues that I'd love to work with you on and we need to address. Thank you, sir. Yes, ma'am. Hi, my name is Melissa Schombach. I have a um, question in a similar vein. I was just wondering if you could speak about maybe some of the trends that you've noticed with domestic terrorism that come from those um, far-right groups that we don't hear as much about in the media. One of the interesting trends, um, there's a really good book out by a woman named Julia Ebner. I work with the Institute for Strategic Dialogue out of London. She just wrote a book that talks about everything from Islamists to the far right. And there's something that's going, she calls it reciprocal radicalization. So what we're seeing is the mirroring of tactics that's being used by groups across the spectrum. If you don't know, we had intel before Charlottesville. We had a lot of intel before Charlottesville. We had intel before Charlottesville about the suggestion that they would run over people that day. We had intel from Charlottesville where they had infiltrated the counter-protest meetings I've seen photographs of their whiteboard sessions. I've seen photographs of their carpools they had planned. They sent photos and identification of individuals in the counter-protest movement to law enforcement. And so we're seeing those very sophisticated and complex strategies that have worked well for people or organizations like ISIS working well for people here. What I'm seeing now on the right is an, an aggressive recruitment strategy for tech-savvy young people to get into that movement. And that's what they're doing. They're going online, it's successful for them, and that's how they're recruiting and radicalizing. One thing that's really interesting, as I talk about RAM in Southern California, these guys are out there in the open about being violent. They're like Antifa. They're very open about being violent. They're very open about not being part of the peaceful demonstration movement. And just to give an example of how current they are, I had a video I was gonna show three weeks ago in a class that RAM put together. When I looked at the video the day before the lecture, they had already dropped that video and updated it with a new one. And they're out there with their names, with their photos, for everyone to see on YouTube and not afraid. And they drop banners over our freeway overpasses about every three weeks, something usually to do with the anti-immigrant movement because they're out there. They are, um, one of the things I can tell you is that they love mixed martial arts. We're finding them in the mixed martial arts clubs. Uh, that seems to be a thing for them. And, and so I'm just kind of giving you the list of things that we're seeing here. Uh, but it's not something that's dissipating. Um, how do we fight that? As to the question before, when we find out who those formers are, we can find out ways to get them out of that movement. But for now, um, they're growing. And, and they're a challenge for us. Very Thank good you. question. Thank you. Good morning, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, my name is John Willingham from Georgia Tech. Uh, towards the beginning of your presentation, you had a slide that showed the trends of the lives that have been lost from the various attacks uh, over the years. Um, and the trend is definitely increasing as the years go on. Uh, in your opinion, do you see this trend continuing in our immediate future, or do you think it's a time it'll plateau off or head down just based on the efforts that you've seen being done? I am an eternal optimist. I'm going to say I hope so. Um, I hope so. Uh, one of the things that disturbs me is, is the fact that, you know, we do have a, an anti-government movement out there. What's the most visible form of government for most people in local communities? It's local law enforcement. Um, what I didn't mention today, and I talked about a number of officers that have been killed in the line of duty, um, that hap that's happened a number of times in France, in fact, when I've been there. Um, so those are things that we have to look at going forward. I think 
that we certainly are getting better at identifying them. Stemming the tide is a community effort. It just really is a community effort. Um, I hope it starts to plateau off and I hope it starts to drop, but it all depends. Um, these organizations and individuals are energized. Uh, we, we probably, I showed you slides from the 60s. I, I mean, I'm dealing with things as an African American that, that I never thought since the 60s I'd have to even think about anymore. So, you know, again, we're part of that solution. And I think that it only starts to subside when we decide there's more of us than them and we do something about it. That's a great question. But, but that's, the, that's a, a really a situation where we need to have the best of America come out and say, we're not going to take this anymore. And you're not going to threaten me. You're not going to threaten my government. And I'm going to be part of the solution. A very good question. Thank you for asking it. Yes, sir. Thank you. And thank you for the work that you're doing for us. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you for the talk. Jeff Maloon, uh, USAFA, Class of 79. Uh, Eric, a two-part question. One was, um, in the statistics that you showed and, and the chart that we were just addressing, uh, the pie chart changed quite a bit because of the number of people. Mm -hmm. um, I would be interested in understanding the statistics based on just the incidents as opposed to the number of people killed in each incidence, because any instance is bad. Right. And then second is, What's also not shown, and maybe you can't talk about it here because it's classified, is the number of attacks that have been thwarted based on the various demographics in those same charts. Okay, great questions. And the only reason I didn't do that, sir, is in the interest of time. Um, so, to the first question on numbers, I wanted to show apples to apples, numbers to numbers. Yeah, when Omar Mateen killed 41, 49 people, it made everything up. What I didn't show you was in that same time frame, you got three times as many attacks or people being killed by the extreme right, but not as many, which is why the numbers didn't jump as high. On the other question with regards to the, the attacks not <laughs> done. So thwarted plots, that's a loaded question, and let me tell you why. Um, we thwart, and, and that information's un, non, it's unclassified, so you can get it, and, if, and we'll talk after, I'll give it to you. We thwarted a number of attacks. The number of attacks that have been thwarted in most cases have been attacks that are associated with Islamic extremism. What's interesting is that the number of attacks that happened where people were killed the number is far greater by white supremacists and extremists, right? In terms of lethality, far greater for white supremacists and extremists, right? Now, when I asked, how, why is it we're thwarting more attacks by Islamic extremists? The sting operations for Islamic extremists carried out by the FBI were like this. Right. Sting operations for white supremacists and alt-right were like this. That could explain why we're thwarting more attacks. I'll send a study to you. I've made my own conclusions, but it seems like we devote more manpower, we throw up more attacks. And that's just me trying to understand that one plus one probably equals two. It could be more complicated than that, but the data is there, and in the interest of time, I just didn't share it. Thank yeah. you for asking. I hope one plus one saves four. <laughs> <laughs> me too. Thank you. Hello, and thank you for being here. Um, I, you had mentioned sovereign citizens as being one of the number one domestic terrorist threats. Um, I work within the state court administrator's office, and so working with judicial, we have contact quite a bit in that paper war mm. you had mentioned. But it seems their ideology is loosely based, so mm -hmm. how, do they, how are they number one with a loosely based ideology? Great question, and thank you for the work you do. First of all, um, let me clarify something. They're a group that we can't find former sovereigns. Because if we find former sovereigns, the first group that organization wants to talk to them is the, is the IRS. Um, <laughs> I'm working with a sovereign. Um, it's a long story how we got connected. Trust me, and I meet with him with his ankle monitor on, and we have conversations. So let me, a couple of things. Number one, he said, when you ever talk to groups, I want you to clear something up. We're not sovereign citizens. Because to be a sovereign citizen is an oxymoron. You can't be a sovereign and a citizen. You tell them we're part of the freedom movement. So I'm telling all of you they're part of the freedom movement. He said the sovereign citizen term is a made-up term that the FBI gave us and we don't like it. Okay. Um, that number one you saw was a survey of 368 law enforcement agencies in America when we asked them, give us your top three domestic terrorism threats. We didn't think it would turn out that way, and it did. Their day-to-day -day 
patrol activities, who do you think as an extremist individual might assault or attack you would be, that was their answer. And that's what they gave us. We hope to duplicate that study this year. But it's a very good question. And to your, the other part, you're right. They are not organized, which makes it extremely difficult for us. They don't have meetings. They, they, stay, they stay offline. Um, they're not organized. They're, they're sort of a, a leaderless resistance, if you will. And you know better than I do. Um, but I can tell you this. This source that I'm working with on a new book, he sent me some videos that were so disturbing, I can't even mention what they talked about in here to show how corrupt our government is. And they all share these videos. And every time I met with him, he had another one to two dozen videos to share with me to say, take a look at this. And this is, how they, this is what they do. They share this with each other. And they've got these lists of YouTube videos that are out there, and that's how they communicate. And they, and they stay away from each other. Thank you. Sir, C2TC. Kovic from CS22. Okay. Um, you talk about how in France there's the medical community and the psychologists and psychiatrists working together with the counter-terror. Mm -hmm. um, so my question is kind of two-part. First, do we have the same cooperation in the United States? And if we do, how do we go about using that information to stop terrorist attacks? Great question. So let me just say this. Um, again, because of the relation, and it's all about relationships. Because of the relationships I have in Lyon, I meet with a number of uh, CT units in Lyon that are off the grid, can't be photographed, um, part of their policing uh, stratus and apparatus there. Um, they closely monitor, all, everybody can interpret this for the way I say it, they closely monitor that community. Um, they have a pretty good fix on a number of what they consider to be radicalized individuals. They've now engaged the communities that you identified being medical, um, counterterrorism, intelligence to do things. Are we doing that here? We're having that discussion here, uh, particularly and especially in Los Angeles. We're talking to now with the LA County Department of Public Health. We would like to do this. It is something that we want to get engaged in. It's, it, are we sharing? We're sharing better. Um, you know, with all due respect, when I had the first slide up there about the World Trade Center, um, you know, I'm from an organization that I love to death, but we didn't play well in the sandbox with people before 9-11. Um, you know, we're in a country where we're number one. That's who we are. I'm, I'm, an, I, you know, I'm a former athlete. I follow sports. I can't tell you who took the silver medal in the Olympics. I can't tell you who, who didn't win the, the championship. I, I can tell you who won. Law enforcement's no different. And so we went through a period of time we didn't work well together. Well, now that's over. We have joint terrorism task forces. We have fusion centers. I walk into those environments and see people, and sometimes it's, Almost as many people as in this room, we don't have to share business cards, so we're getting better. So we hope to get into that realm, but we, don't, we are not monitoring communities the way that they are in France. Do we have to do that to get to this point? I don't know. But it is something as a discipline and in terms of research of connecting mental health and the medical profession with counterterrorism and the intelligence community that I think we have to go do going forward. So kind of following up on that, um, in France, have they noticed a connection between mental health issues and the terrorist attacks, or are they disconnected? I'm gonna give you the number they gave me with no data to support it. They believe one third of their radicalized individuals suffer from some form of mental illness. Okay. One third, and, I, and I'll just say this, the numbers are, are five digits in terms of the number of people they believe are radicalized in the country. That's a huge number. I don't know how they've arrived at that, but that's the number they're working with. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for your questions. Thank you again on behalf of our 2018 NCOS par participants, the cadet wing, and the faculty and staff of the United States Air Force Academy. We would like to present you with a small token of our appreciation. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Yeah.